far, right? Amen. Okay, today I'll be teaching. I've not really taught in a while. You know, the Bible says the kingdom of God is like unto a living, which a woman hid in three measures of flour till the whole was living. So if you have a sound, thorough, doctrinal teaching, it is as good as the kingdom of God. It's infallible. It cannot fail. It works, which is what we want to do this morning. How did I come about that? Someone came to meet me two weeks ago. He said, Pastor, I don't understand. You said if we confess and it looks to spiral down, we should confess again. But I was somewhere, they said, when you go to God and it goes this way, you don't go back to God. Once you've said it once, you don't change. And on and on and on. It's a bit confusing. I said, okay, I'll do a thorough, detailed teaching. I'm not sure we can finish today, but this time around, if we don't finish today, I'll continue next week Sunday by God's grace. I think I have so many um, topics hanging, right? Eh? Like, uh, is it up to like four or ten? More than ten. About five. Four. Uh, that sounds political because I know it's more than four. <laughs> I, you know, you know that king that said they should come and tell him about it. He knew. I that said, is it four? I knew it's more than four. So I was watching you. I said, is it ten? You now said no, it's four. <laughs> Amen. There are certain processes if you have the understanding and the procedure of how it works. Even God can stop it. Nothing in this life can stop it. It works. We're looking at five major aspects. One is approaching God. Two is your presentation before God and sealing a deal with God. Three, is your confession when you leave that place. And people don't know that confession varies because <clears throat> I think I shared this before in the case of Lazarus when he first said this sickness will not lead to death but for the glory of God. When Lazarus died, he didn't change. He said, for I tell you our friend Lazarus sleepeth but I go to wake him up and God will be glorified. So the confession does not change, but wisdom can adjust it based on the events presented themselves. We'll look at that in thorough detail. And you'll find where you can say, it is white, then it changes. Then you, you don't change from the original deal you sealed with God in that room, in that holy place. But there could be variations to how you confess being monitored and being controlled by wisdom. So we look at approaching God, presenting your case, and sealing a deal with God. Then the confession that follows after. Then establishing that faith then the peace and the assurance that comes with it. So today we're starting with approaching God. And I remember I was teaching like this, maybe like about 15, 16, 17 years ago. And I said, I need a case study. And somebody raised their hand. I said, okay, let's use your husband. The husband comes in the morning, drops her, and drives off. When they finish service, they call him. He'll come and pick them and take them back to there. I said, okay, let's pray. I say, Father, you know, we prayed as, it was a prayer seminar. I was taking a seminar. So I used a case to teach in the seminar. So said, okay, what's the name? Okay, you don't say save him. God has already saved him. He's the one that has refused to accept salvation. So you don't say God save him. So I said, Father, Romans 10 said, how shall they be saved? They send someone be sent. All right? I send someone preach. As I someone preach, I send someone be sent. So he said, somebody send somebody to him with the gospel of peace and open his heart to receive 
and break every heart of stone in him. So as we use that example to pray, then we say, now, this is how you confess. In a month, he was saved. And instead of dropping them, he started coming to city church, and that's how the family got saved. It works. It works. It works. So we start with, all right, you have an issue, right? Actually, it's supposed to be like a seminar. It's supposed to make it like a seminar. Let me see if I can see, turn into a seminar in service. What's the difference between seminar and service? Let me see. In seminar, you ask questions. In seminar, there's coffee. There's coffee break, Abby. Suggest you say, yep. You're quick to say, yep. <laughs> okay, in seminar, there's coffee. There's tea. In seminar, they don't take offering, Abby. No, we change it to service. <laughs> no, no, that was a joke. All right, let's get back to the meeting. And you know, look as if all this man is taking his offering. <coughs> Amen. All right. So you have an issue, and you need God's intervention in the issue. Let's say you have a child that he that all has a, let me use the word, a terminal ailment. And um, it's medically impossible to cure. You know, like Jairus went to the Lord. He said, come lay your hands on my daughter that she may live and not die. So, you go to God in prayer. And then you approach God. First, the Bible tells you how to approach God. In Hebrews 11 verse 6. For with, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God, if you are coming to God, concerning your daughter. I'm using an example now. Or daughter, or you, 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 somebody has promised you an appointment. Or which example should we use? Should we stick with the daughter, the ailment, the son? Or which one? Or a job? Or a contract? When I said the daughter, no much said. When I said the son, when I said the contract, the voice raised. Eh? Or the salvation of your mom? See, no, no, no response. Salvation of your husband? No much response. A financial breakthrough? Even the smile gives you away. I'll stick to the health issue. <laughs> All right. If you are coming to God on behalf of your Child, your son, he says, but without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and is a rewarder of them that approach him. Meaning, you don't come in there and go out empty. You must believe it. In Matthew 7, is it Matthew 7 or Matthew 8? A leper approached the Lord Jesus. He said, is it Matthew 8, 1 or Matthew 7, 1? Let me see. Okay, it's Matthew 8, 1 to 2. A leper came to him and he said, look at what he said in verse 2. There came a leper and worshipped him saying, Lord, if you will, you can. I'm not doubting your ability to heal. I'm not sure you are willing to. I'm not doubt. He said, if you will, the will is with if. Thou can. Meaning, I know you can cure this leprosy. But I'm not sure whether you are willing to answer me or not. Then he responded. And he said in verse 3, I will. Meaning, I am willing and I can. So when you go to God, you must believe he's willing and he can. Otherwise, he will not answer you. Luke 11 says, and he gave a parable, and he said, you're going to take your time to this. I probably will finish this in two services, but I need you to understand. Once you know it, once you know it, the Lord appeared to me September 2000. Say from today, whenever you pray, there shall be results. Now, do you think the Lord will tell somebody 
that when he prays, he will have results that doesn't know how to pray. He told Samuel, no word of your mouth will fall to the ground. Do you think the Lord will tell somebody who speaks and doubts in his heart that his word will not fall to the ground? His word cannot be broken. So by the time he's telling Samuel, your word will fall to the ground, then Samuel knows, Mark eleven twenty three. 23. When he speaks, he believes what he says and he does not doubt. Then the Lord reinforced it by further establishing it to him. So in Luke 11, they approached the man and said, Lord, the Lord said, Lord, teach us to pray. Sorry, excuse me. Even as John taught his disciples to pray. I'm okay like this, right? Moving around, okay. Because it actually, is, it, it, I can't even make a religious front because the entire concept is beyond religious front. So I'd have done it, but let's go on. Say, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. Then he went on. When you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is written. Give us this day our daily bread. You know the story, our Lord's Prayer. Then he went further. to say, which of you? I need to open it and read it. And this is how you approach God. Luke 11. I'll read from verse um, 5. He said to them, Which of you shall have a friend? And go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey is come. You know, he's teaching on prayer. Let me back up. It came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught us. So he's teaching them prayer. Then he said that a Lord's prayer. Then he now, he now jumped to verse, um, verse 5. So he's still teaching prayer with this story. Which of you shall have a friend? Go to him at midnight. So he has established something. There is no awkward time to approach God. There is no good time to approach God. There is no bad time to approach God. And you know, some people say, hmm, if you want to really have a breakthrough, let me tell you the best time to pray. Yeah. This story negates it. Did you hear me? And then he says, um, pray without season. Negates it too. That's First Thessalonians 5. Okay? Those are religious concepts you can't approach God with. And if you approach him, and it's not 3 a.m., it may not answer you. Do you get it? And if Satan knows it's only 3 a.m., you have faith in, he will delay your sleep, he will blow, and then just will allow him. <sighs> so you wake up at 3.15. And God says it's not 3. Because all things are possible to him that believeth. All right, so let's go on. And say to him, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine in his journey is come to me. I have nothing set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say to you, though he will not rise and give him because he's his friend, yet because of his importunity he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So he's saying when you approach God, Hebrews 10. So we're first starting with the approach. Hebrews 10, I read verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Also Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Everything is boldness, boldness, boldness. That we may obtain mercy and find grace in time of need. So the approach must be Confidence. What are the confidence? Number one, he is who he said he is. Number two, he will give you as many as you need. Number three, he's willing. He's able. What boldness do you also have? You have a right to come. Because you are coming in the name of Jesus. You are a child. You are not a servant. It's your right. 
I just won't tell you come ah baba mi o ni gba o ninu te nbi mi pelu ko to sele honestly speaking baba bi wa se pe mo bi respect ale da gbo eru gbo se wole yo i didn't say you should approach that way oh. i didn't want to warn you but that's the audacious nature you can approach god with if you approach him timid you may go with unanswered prayers all right are we establishing that so the approach is that you must believe that he is both willing and able and is a rewarder meaning if you get it right you will get it there okay and he also taught us in Luke 11 you may not be Moses you may not be Kenneth Hagin you may not be Benny Hinn you may not be all those great men of God you have right like each and every one of them and the way they can get it, you can get it. The way Jesus can get it, you can get it. The same right Jesus has, you have. And that's the way you approach the throne. Okay? Good. Number two. When you approach, in that Luke 11, it starts with our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It depends on the scenario you are finding yourself. If it's an emergency, God knows there's no room for praises. You get it? Heavenly Father, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Some of you have a template. It would rather you be very natural. That's why he said that man that approached God could not but beat his chest and say, Lord, have mercy. And the Bible says he went home more justified than the rest. All right? So let your approach be natural. Leave the templates. You know, some have templates. Even I've been, when I was in the world, <laughs> I, I even said like those white garments, they, they want to pray. Say, um, <laughs> they seem to recite, they have a recitation. Hello? Why are you looking at me and say you don't know what I'm talking about? But why are you looking down? You're, most of you went through it now. Ben wants to be and measurement. Ben was okay. All was okay, me. All who are me. But now, my baba, I was here. All who are Shanu, 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 Shanu. Walk us all more, eh? It's like a template, and they just recite. You get it? At least I'm honest. <laughs> I'm very honest. Right? In those days, <laughs> long, long before, on God's sake. Okay. All right. Where was I? <laughs> so, um, leave the erotics. Leave the erotics and be natural. You saw how the prodigal son did when he came to the father. He didn't say, Father, you're a very good man. You are kind. Honestly. You get it? That doesn't mean you don't praise him, but be very natural, okay? All right. In Isaiah 41, we'll be looking at presenting your course with the technical bit now. Isaiah 41. It's raining. Verse 21. Produce your course, said the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, said the king of Jacob. All right. Let's start with... Um, John 16. I would have just summarized it and give you the other technical, but I want to give you the detailed plan of it, how it works, okay? John 16, verse 21, from verse 23 or so. 23. In that day you have asked me nothing. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Either do have you asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. So when you are approaching him, you are to ask him what to make your joy full. For example, somebody wronged you and said, you this poverty stinking guy. Now, if him dying will make your joy full and that person is still in poverty, but if you make him money, it will make your joy full. You have to ask what will make your joy full. 
There's a place of Luke 18 for vengeance. We'll look at that some other time. But what will make you joyful is you ask. If somebody called you a poverty stricken and doesn't know that you are a thousand times richer than him, will you be sad? So what will make you joyful is that financial blessing, right? So that's what you ask the father. What will make your joy full? And he said, whatsoever you ask in my name, the father will give it to you, but make sure you ask that which will make your joy full. So they're giving us technical depths of what to ask. So you ask what will make your joy full. That's John 16, 23 to 24. Now, <coughs> To buttress this, if you go to James chapter 4, from verse 6. When the disciples were threatened, and in Acts 4, and they beat them, and they were threatened not to talk in the name again. When they went to God in prayer, they didn't say God killed them. He said, behold their threats. Grant to us boldness to speak your word. Then move further. Signs and wonders follow everything we say now. And immediately it started happening. When it comes to vengeance, I will show you how to handle that one. If you go to God like this, and you talk on this enemy, let them die. He will be angry. Oh. He will get angry. There's a way to do that. But this one, you must know how to deal with the father. You must know what gets him angry, what makes him happy. You must know what you do so that he will give you everything. That you, the thing you ask, he will give you. The thing you ask, he will give you. Okay? In James chapter 4, I read from verse 2 to 3. It says, you lost, you have not, you kill, you desire to have, you cannot obtain, you fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask and miss. So, God may not grant if the person asks amiss. What is asking amiss? He just told you the verse before. You are asking for lust. You are asking to kill. You are asking to fight. You are asking to war. Father, they need to know that this nonsense cannot continue. It's time they know in this town that I'm not their mate. He will not grant their request. Did you hear me? James, look, these are basic technical things that knocks out prayer. I need you to follow me. James 2, uh, James 4, verse 2 says, you ask a miss. Then he gave you an idea of asking a miss. He asked to consume on lust. You ask to kill. You ask to fight. You ask for war. Father, you see them. It's not me or they've insulted. It's your norm. It's your son they insulted. Because I'm a Christian. They're not a Christian. They said I'm, a, I, I'm an impoverished uh, wretch. All their finances will drown in the name of Jesus. He won't answer it. Because... What is bringing their finances are processes he has endorsed, which includes like with, uh, summer, uh, winter, uh, seed, harvest, and they are following those processes. That's why when David prayed, if you notice, turn the castle of Ahitophel to foolishness. God did not answer him. Was Ahitophel doing him damage? Yes. He said, let his castle. God did not answer him. Do you know how many people pray for Buari to die? God didn't answer that prayer. <laughs> he didn't answer it. <laughs> eh? Probably some of us pray for this one. He would answer it. He would answer them. So you must understand how to get rid of this kind of people. It's not this way. Later on, we'll finish this one. That one will be a special meeting of how to destroy, how to build how to plant, how to lay waste, how to kill and make a life. I will know who to call for that meeting. <laughs> Praise God. Back to what we're saying, I use James 4 to buttress that, that you must ask what to make your joy full. And we said, John 16, 23 to 24. Now in Philippians chapter 4, helps us buttress better how to go about it. Philippians chapter 4, verse Six to seven. It says, be careful for nothing, 
But in everything by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Let your request be made known to God. What's the request? What will make you joyful? When you present it to God, that means as you're going to God, you enter God's presence boldly. You enter God's presence audacious with respect. To, are you getting it? With respect. Then you approach God and tell him what will make you joyful. How? By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving in the name of Jesus. It's not done yet. Is it getting complicated? All right. So, John 16 just tells you, ask him anything, in the name of Jesus, he'll give it to you, so long as it will make you joyful. Philippians adds to it, no, don't just ask anything. Ask anything by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving. Meaning, you must give thanks as you present your case and present your reason why he must do it. That's prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Why the thanksgiving? Once he has agreed to your request, you must thank him. That's why they say he gives his rate to the thankful and the unthankful. In uh, the parable of the, um, the ten lepers shows that he likes the thankful. He appreciates the thankful. And once he tells you it is done, you don't wait to see to know it is done. It is done. So you thank him before leaving that presence. Do you get it? Philippians guides you into that. Now, the first part says approach with boldness and confidence. The second part says, approaching with a request that will make you joyful. And in approaching with your request that will make you joyful, ask him by prayer, supplication. So, supplication is the reason why he must do it. And once he agrees, make sure you thank him there before you leave. And then 1 John 3.22. Let me skip 1 John 3.22. 1 John 5.14. First John 5, verse 14. And it says, This is the confidence we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us, if we know that he has heard us. Whatsoever we ask, we know it is done. So, the case before God is the request that will make you joyful. And if you back up in John 16, if you back up to verse 21, they gave you an example of what will make somebody joyful. She was in labor. She was in pain. But she gave birth to a man child and her joy was full. <coughs> Meaning, if she's in labor and you go to God, the request should be bothering more on her giving birth, not reducing the pain. Let me drop. You must understand, when the Lord gives a story, and he tells you something. He's trying to use that story to address and explain further. Just before that, John 16, 23, in verse 21, it tells you, a woman is in labor, has traveled because her hour has come. But as soon as she gives birth to a man child, her joy comes. Then he says, whatsoever you ask the Father, will give it to you. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may come. Be full. What made her joy full? The birth of the boy, not the going of the pain. If a woman is abused in marriage now, there's a way you go to God. What you're going to ask God is what will make her joyful there. If a child is sick, what will make the joyful there? If a man has no job, it's what will make the joyful. Are you getting it? But many times, people take the wrong request to God. They say, Lord, the pain is too much. Reduce it. That will make the joyful because if the pain goes and the child does not come, the joy is still not full. Did you get it? But when the child comes, the pain goes. So concentrate on the child and leave the pain. Some people go to God and concentrate on the pain. They pray and miss, and God will answer. And they're wondering what happened. And the woman and the child died. They say, you didn't? And I went to God, oh, and we fasted. But what are you asking God? That the pain should go. Who told you that's the issue? The issue is the child should come. And the child should come alive and healthy. Are you getting it?
So, First John 5 says, if you can present your reason, first it is his will that your joy be full. And if there's a situation where your joy is not full, and you're telling him what to do that will make your joy full, and you can give him the reason why he must do it, and he accepts, he said, this is that confidence that we know. He didn't say we believe. We know that the petition is granted. Once you know, you thank him. Philippians 4 now comes in with thanksgiving. But the request and the argument first. That's why in Acts 4, when they beat them, they didn't say, God, don't let them touch us again. No. Did they pray like that? God. Mm. All these Pharisees blind their eyes. Actually, that's how the church prays. Abi, blind their eyes so that they will not see us who arrest us in Jesus. No. He said, Lord, behold their threats. You just make sure that we have the audacious boldness to proclaim your word. As we are saying it, as he's coming, confirm. If he's hunched back, as we are, let it be disappearing. Let even dwarves be growing while we are preaching. Let the dead, no, let us wait to touch them. Oh God, as we stand and they come under that canopy, let them just rise. That was what they prayed. And immediately God granted it. If you know they didn't pray, deal with this uh, Pharisee oh, that arrested oh, that man that beat, that one that even took the pain. Okay, that says he's going to beat us more. Let him just slum and die. No. Do you know that even those people will get saved for what you are praying? And they'll be your disciples. Right? Abby? Now, you can deal with those men that use Cain. That one, you don't need to go to God. I will show you how to. But I told you, a select few I will bring to that one. I'm already counting. I'm already noticing those. I will, to the last circle that we will talk about that one. We will deal with them. They will fall down and what? Fall down and what? Fall down and what? You still have it inside of you, but it's a All right. When you leave that place, and he has had you, and he has granted your request, then you must go to stage three, the confession to align with what you are saying, what you have agreed with God. If you notice, they didn't teach Mary any confession. They said, hell, highly favored one. He said, you have found favor with God. Thou shalt have a son. He shall call his name Jesus. He shall save the people from their sins. On and on and on. They said, how shall this be seen? And they said, the Holy Ghost will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. That's a, that's stage two. She and God, they're having an issue. And the angel said, so be. And she said, be it unto me. Uh, let there be a performance of that which was. And the angel said, she cannot finish as she left that place. My soul doth magnify. As she are coming out of God's presence, you must, you must start it. My soul doth magnify God. My spirit has rejoiced in God myself. For he has regarded the lowest state of his maiden from henceforth. All generations shall call me blessed for faithful is he who has remembered Abraham in his promise. Who taught her that? That's what you must say when you leave that presence. He wants to hear it in his ears. Then Satan too is waiting for you. Then you see it with God. Now here you go meet us. <laughs> we know if you enter that place, but as you come out, as you come out here, we the wait. We the wait. With what? Doubt. <laughs> because you have received already. As the Lord said, it is done. It is done. You have received, but you have not had it. You don't have it yet. But you have received. Between receiving and having, Satan will show up. So, you say, you want born, eh? Doctor never tell you, say egg, no form. And I'm born with you, without egg. What did they do in herself? Eh? It just not stay talk. Even two don't block. Then God will wait to hear what you will respond. That's where the battle starts. You see that holy place? Now, jolly, jolly. Jolly, jolly. You see, Elijah came out and said, there shall be no dew or rain according to the word, to my word, the Lord God before whom I stand. So it was coming from God's presence. That's why James says he prayed first. 
<coughs> you get it? He prayed. When he prayed, he said, there shall, first Kings 17, there shall be no dew nor rain according to my word before the Lord God, before whom I word I stand. So he has stood before God. He has said, I don't want rain. God said, why don't you want rain? And he gave the reason by, and God says, so be it as you have spoken. As he turned, say, don't plant. There's no rain. <laughs> say, well, say, well, last come. No rain, no dew according to my word. Jesus. Jesus. And there can be, <laughs> there can be, once you are sealed with God in that room, there can be, the only way there will be if you doubt. <laughs> the only way there will be if you doubt. And you can't go back to God and say, God, I asked you. Eh? That's unbelief. You negate everything. What changes and fluctuates your confession? Stage three. Mark 11. Are we following? Because I'm going somewhere. I'm still going somewhere. You're following me. Okay. You know, this teaching is actually the kingdom of God. But once you understand it, and you know how to deal with it. So I don't know how to hear God. So when you leave that place, the Bible says, is it first Thessalonians chapter one? It says, for our gospel was in much assurance and in the Holy Ghost. You just know that you know that you know. Case closed. Oh, it's Oh, it's As you walk out of that place, ah, I love Mary. From hence, ah, ah. Somebody look at her. Ah, what's wrong with this? Uh, you don't know what she has. That's why be careful when people talk and how you respond because you don't know what they have sealed with God in the in our room. And if you speak against it, you might find yourself in big trouble. Do you get it? Stay out of what you don't know. Did you hear me? There's only two ways you step into a case. God tells you, this man is a thief. Or guy, you are a thief. Or the authorities arrest him. They take him to court. They try him and he's pronounced guilty. Then you say, oh God, you are a thief. Outside of that, only a fool judges a case without hearing the two sides of it. And Satan can go before God and say, but this your daughter is a fool. And Jesus said, why do you call him before? He just judged the case without hearing the two sides. So he's a fool and you know the portion of fool. You know, just give me access to deal with her as a fool. Since she has behaved according to your word as a fool, and I have right to execute the bad portion of your word <laughs> and the bad uh, vigilante, no vigilante, and the jihadist <laughs> that implements the bad boy's side. You know, if God says that, if honor thy father and thy mother, that may be well with you. And you don't honor your parents. You know, God won't come and make you not be well with you. You know, he doesn't, Bible says he doesn't tempt any man with evil. You get it? Who is coming to implement that one? It's Satan. He says, well, you know I'm the one that doesn't make you well with people. And your word says that if they don't, you know, she just dishonored, he just abused his mother. Called her a moron and a stupid woman. Eh, eh, so, why are you making it? That's what Satan was telling God. So you are unjust. You are partial. God said, I'm not partial. He said, but Job is in fear. Why is he protected? <coughs> Job is not in faith. Why is he protected? God said, you are the one that is blind. The hedge has been broken. You didn't see it. See, I'm just. Car. Say, but wait. Don't touch his life. He is not afraid for his life. He has been doing sacrifices for his children out of fear. He has not done one for himself. So he's not afraid for his So don't touch his life. And I think Job from the way his wife was behaving, cause God and die. I don't think he was doing sacrifice for his wife, probably even wishing her to die self. And if you notice, he has not done sacrifice for his wife. The way you wish death, she did. She... I think it's that woman that gave birth to the new set of children. The Bible didn't say his wife died, have you? I didn't say Job wished her death, though. But I don't think Job, how can a man be in that state and the woman says, cause God and die? And you know how most men behave. Eh? I, I'm not talking, no. You know how a lot of men behave. So there's a possibility. He didn't mind for her to die. 
I have you noticed that those people that was those husbands that live longer. <laughs> if you have a wife very saucy, very arrogant, tell her, oh, tell her, cook better, so tell G. I like better, tell cook better, and they don't die. You have you noticed those women? They live long. <laughs> it's a woman that doesn't talk and submits to you like a moron. Those are the ones that usually die more. I don't know why. I just noticed it. <laughs> and you see that when talking to his friend, I don't know how I married this one. Follow the table, your crook like yeah. You have it, Kai. And they don't even fall sick. That's the worst part. <laughs> my mom asked me, "Why is he like the money call you?" I don't know. Well, now I'm mystery like Jesus. All right, let's go on, please. Let's go on before we get distracted again. Oh, I said Mark 11, right? Okay, good, good. All right. Let's start from, <laughs> from verse 12. On the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry and seen a fig tree afar off, having leaves. He came, if happily might find anything thereof. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. Jesus answered and said, Did no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever? And his disciples heard it. We jump to verse 21. Peter calling to remembrance. Sorry, 20. The morning as they passed by, he saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Peter calling to remembrance said to him, Master, the fig tree which you curse is withered away. Jesus answering said to them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, shall not doubt in his heart. But shall believe that those things which he said shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say to you, whatsoever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them. So it's actually teaching you about prayer. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, you shall have them. When you stand praying, forgive if you have ought, we'll come to that later. So the confession is based on what you prayed that you believe. What you prayed that you believe. A typical example is in John 11 about Lazarus. When Jesus prayed to the father on Lazarus, when he told him Lazarus was sick, and he went before his father, and he signed a deal. I want Lazarus to live. And the father granted him, he shall live. When he came out of that place, he came out thanking God that Lazarus lives. Okay? But how many days later, he sent him a message that Lazarus is dead. Right? Then, when he came out of that closet, the first thing he said, maybe we should look at it. The first confession he said, John 11. Verse 4. <coughs> this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Meaning, this sickness will not lead to death, but it will lead to the glory of God and the Son of God, meaning he, Jesus, will be glorified in Lazarus' sickness. That was his confession. This sickness will not lead to death. But in this sickness, God will be glorified. I will be magnified. That was his confession. After praying to God. Because when he got to the tomb, he said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. So he prayed first before saying this, though it didn't look like he prayed. But at the tomb, he said, I thank you that you heard me when I prayed. So there was a deal in that closet with God. And leaving that closet... What came out of his mouth is, hey, guys, relax. This sickness is not going to lead to death. But in this sickness, God will be glorified. My own ministry will start. <laughs> then you know that God called me. All right. What happened next? Or God Lazarus died. When Lazarus died, what did he say? Our friend Lazarus sleep. You can see variation in the confession in line with what they agreed with God. 
but I go to wake him up. He didn't say, I reject it in Jesus' name. Like, yeah, he can't die. He's dead. Did you hear me? Otiku, he's dead. I reject it. That's how Christians miss it. Do you get it? <clears throat> so the confession must align with what you agreed with God. Now, Satan tries to vary the situation in order to change your confession, to disagree with God. Did you hear what I said? Satan tries to vary the situation such that you will change your confession so that you will no longer agree with God. But Jesus changed his confession without disagreeing with God. He said, I acknowledge. He didn't even say he's dead. Our friends sleep. But I will wake him from sleep so that God will be glorified and I will still be glorified. The confession has not changed, though it has varied based on the event that just happened. And your confession can keep varying as events keep unfolding. Because Satan will keep changing and bringing variations. All he's trying to do is to make you say what will disagree with what you agreed with God in that closet. That's all he's looking at. Once you say something that disagrees, it's over. He walks away. Case closed. It's not going to happen again. And that's where people miss it. Where's the scripture? Where he told them to walk on water? Um... Did he tell them to walk on water? I sound like four scribes. Tell me who's supposed to be one of my scribes. I'll tell me where Jesus walked on water. Eh? Who else are the other scribes I have? Everybody's putting their head down. You don't want me to call you. Because I'll tell you, go and check where is this one. I can even tell you to check somewhere in lamentation. When last did you go to lamentation? <laughs> hey, Pastor. <laughs> is there even a book called lamentation? All right, where did he say walk the water? Matthew 14. Thank you. 14, 22. That's Avi? I'm spiritually. Baba. That's Baba for you. <laughs> I asked somebody, what would I be like? I was a pastor. Say, ah! <laughs> so I can't say it. <laughs> say, Pastor, I can't say it. But I'll be a nice guy. I've been going to tell you, don't think I'll be a nice guy. Thank you, Jerry. I trust that to tell you. You start being a nice guy. <laughs> Matthew 14. <laughs> and straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitude away. When he had sent the multitude away, he went up to a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. And the ship now in the midst of the sea tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a spirit. And they cried out for fear. Straightway Jesus spoke to them, Be of good cheer, says, I be not afraid. Then, take note. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, bid me to come to thee on the water. And he said, Come. So that was the argument. Come how? On water. That was their agreement. Satan said, You won't walk on water. All right, make with the sea. When Peter was come out of the ship, he was walking on the water. Can Satan stop him from walking on water? No! He can't. Who will stop him from walking on water? Can Jesus stop him? No! He has given his word. It will not fall to the ground. So who will stop him from walking on water? Peter. And how will Satan stop him? See what he did. When he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. Cried, saying, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand, caught him, and said, Why did you doubt? So, doubt will truncate it. And how will doubt come? Satan will just bring what he, you and I know that we have read from the books that if things turn A to C, it is disaster. And God has told it's going to be from A to E, and it's a blessing. He just turns it to C. And Satan said, you don't turn to see you. What are you going to do? You have the option. Peter could have said, oh, wind, be calm. And it will be calm. 
And Peter could have ignored the wind. You are not strong enough to stop the word of God and walk into Jesus on water. And he walks. When in Mark 5, he said to them, we cross, it is a, we shall, we cross to the other side. That's the agreement between Jesus and the disciples. We cross to the other side. While they were going, the Bible says the waves was blowing water into the boat. What did they say? Bye bye. We are drowning. That's what Satan was looking for. And that's why he brought the waves. If they said, the waves, we cross to the other side. With water in that boat, they'll get to the other side. It will not down. Huh. It will not down. And he knows, Satan knows it will not drown. But he knows. <coughs> and he, he, they did what many people did. Lord, don't you even have any compassion in you ah, to see that we perish? You know, many people have kissed God. Oh, Lord, they won't be back. Right? Ah, Satan says, who did that? He said, Belzebub, Belzebub, carry promotion. Well done, well done, well done, well done, well done. Hmm. Say, we didn't even stop it. We made him accuse God. Give Belzebub promotion. Hmm. This is where failure comes. This is where everything is established. The confession. I have to stop. We'll continue next week. Eh? You want us to continue now? All right. Uh, do we have maths? Can please help us get maths like 200. Line it here. Then, but wait till. That means I might have to organize lunch. <laughs> I think we'll close. Don't worry. <laughs> we'll close. Because of that lunch, we have to close. Because um, the plan is how I'm going to eat my own special lunch. That means they will join me in that one. Let me close it so that they can. <laughs> All right. We'll look more into the confession and how you vary it when things are changing. Do you get it? As bad as some cases are, it's bad and it's over. It's bad and it's over. I know a case of a pregnancy and the woman suffered miscarriage. And the blood, the baby had gone. Scansion is gone. The next thing she said, the next one will start. Are you cool, child? Satan was finished. That's the worst one. The next, and the next one's finished. And give back to the next one. That's how serious it is. You get it? They say, oh, God, what? No. Say the next one will stand. I say, wow. And the next one's finished. And the child is alive. Against all odds. I said we'll continue next week. And, but are you getting it so far? Yeah. You're beginning to understand how Satan operates, harasses people. Eh? <laughs> Praise God. I want the Holy Spirit to help you for as you go to the house. We've learned some things. Even what we've learned. You can still use this once. But then I need the Holy Spirit to take you further, expound to you deeper, bring it to you in the contemporary terms of your own situation and circumstance. Guide you. He said in Psalm 32, verse 8, He will instruct you, I will teach you, I will guide you, I will instruct you, I will teach you, I will guide you so that you will profit. There will be no loss in your life again. It will be all profit, profit, profit. In the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.